well, we're here for um, a conversation with the artist Meg Coburn and uh, to understand a little bit more what is what is the secret of creation, what is the passion for creation, what is the meaning in your life for creation. Let's start with there and we'll start the conversation, Meg. Well, um, hello, Milagros, and uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, the, uh, the passion for creation, I, I think you're just born with that thing and you have to do it. So I've been a printmaker and a painter and a costumer. I've, I've made things my whole life. I, when I was younger, you couldn't stop me drawing. I was drawing all the time. So it's, uh, I think it's something you have to do and it's like giving birth and it comes directly from you and you just have to do it because you have to do it and it's it's not about anything but but making that thing so well that's important you said something very important it's like a giving birth it is yes there's a joy to it but uh it's also uh painful in a way i think if you're honest about what you're doing and and it's meaningful and when you go to a painting or approach to uh a drawing how how do you how do you feel about it? How how the ideas come out into you? Well, what is it that uh, comes into you to start the process of creation? What you have inside and put it into a paper or put it into a canvas? Well, typically uh, there's some observation I've made or some a dream or um, a personal experience uh, that I. Uh, try to connect in some way to um, something that's meaningful beyond me, uh, that's meaningful in a, in a broader universal sense to people. And uh, then I just, I research that thing and I, I bring it all together as, as a, a story. So you, you get an idea or a dream and then what is the next step that you proceed to in, in your process of creation? Well, first I have to sort of analyze that thing, especially if it was a dream. What, did, what does that actually mean? Why is that meaningful to me? And then I will look at the different aspects of it. If it's uh, tied to uh, a societal critique, which often my work is, then I, I'll look at those things. I, I watch a lot of news. I stay uh, very connected uh, to current events, but also I have a lot of different interests in science and, say, microbiology and uh, just different societal issues, and uh, I'll decide what thread I actually want to portray in the painting, and uh, then the figures in the painting and the meaning of the painting, I try to tie these things to some sort of story that's a, a more universal to bring this the meaning out and, and so art. those figures are coming out to you come into a dream or just also you just in, uh, get a process of insight how do they come the figures that we see in your paintings for example well i i use different mythologies and stories i think stories are really the most important thing in life whether it's uh, stories in religion or uh, just the news, there's a lot of stories or uh, stories we like to see on TV or movies or um, different mythologies. Uh, that, that's what uh, really brings meaning to life for people. Uh, so I try to tie my ideas about something into one of these stories to bring it forth into people. Uh, and the um, so the figures in my paintings are generally from uh, biblical mythology or uh, say voodoo or Greek mythology uh, or you know uh, old scientific beliefs or you know and it, really any anything that gave meaning to people that uh, that we believe. So I I and I know. Your show right now that is at Mia Curatorial is a solo show that is running right now, so you can visit it also in Little Haiti that I already curated, of course. Hey. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, I saw in these paintings uh, one very important thing, that is how dreams are 
very much one main source that comes to you and you base that. And then after that, you just recreated that into, into a wider perspective. But, for example, the... Um, the, one of the most important paintings in the show is uh, Descending to Illuminated Dream. Uh, Descending to Illuminated Dream. Uh, tell us, uh, how was your dream and how do you perform? This is a figure that is, you know, let's uh, for the listeners in here, is a woman that is backwards and it's coming into a kind of a dark waters. And how that, because you were saying there in the exhibition in the art talk that you did, uh, that that woman was, uh, first of all, dreamt. Yes. And so how did you prepare that from that dream into the painting? Well, uh, first of all, I, I dream almost every night. And they're, they're very long dreams. They'll have, you know, 100 people in them. And, and you remember them? Oh, all yes. It's in color. They're extremely detailed. They're wow. Very, uh, and so that particular dream uh, was very impactful to me. Uh, it was during a time when I really had lost everything and I was recreating myself. And so when I had that dream uh, that of myself uh, descending, sinking headfirst into these dark waters uh, and looking up at my body and seeing all my dreams illuminated and running across my body, I uh, first, you know, thought about, well, gosh, what does this mean? And and it was about uh, this recreation of myself. So all the meaning in my life, all my past and my hopes and fears and beliefs, I was kind of putting them all into perspective and reviewing them while I was sinking into these waters. Uh, and um, so that's... Uh, I drew this several times. You know, how How am I going to paint this and, and show it uh, and that's and that's how I came about I don't know if you want me to explain the painting more well me. we can see the painting <laughs> but I, yes. I see the uh, the sense of of the of this figure women uh, sinking into the waters it's, it's very it's very uh, deep and dramatic in there but what I'm astonished is to see how your dreams are so much uh, a main source in your paintings. After that, well, of course, you recreate them into cultural references, etc., giving a wider perspective. But it, it's interesting how a person can remember the dreams so detailed and so, you know, so presently every night. I dream, but, you know, sometimes <laughs> I remember them, sometimes I don't remember them. I can't. So how do you do? Do you just dream and you write it down or you just keep it in your mind or just remember it? Uh, well, I, I have a, uh, a photographic memory, mm. and uh, I just I think that uh, I've always been very tied to my dream life because it is so impactful. It's almost like... My waking life, in a way, uh, because it's it's so real. Uh, you know, sometimes I I'll talk or walk in my sleep and stuff. But uh, you know, the dreams the dreams are, are very real, and 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 they are a message from your subconscious. You're putting all these things together, and sometimes I, I don't know what it means. I just you know I'll draw some detail from it. And I think, wow, that's really something crazy and I'll, I'll work this out later but uh, no I, I just I just remember them so you draw them after you wake up or you draw them during the night and you say you you walk in this in your sleep yeah well oh, I, I, so I used rich. to a lot <laughs> and uh, roommates I've had I, I've told them you know if I'm talking don't talk to me because I'll, I will be very cranky <laughs> if I'm talking in my sleep. Other times I'll be talking and they think, "Oh, you're asleep," and they don't respond to me. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, I just I have a very, very, very active dream life, and 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 I think that that is uh, uh, dreams are very meaningful. They, your your mind is trying to tell you something. And so that's as a human being, also that's a privilege yes. that the dreams are so present and so actively. Uh, feeding the possibilities in the in your creation in there. 
Yes. But also I just wanted to talk to you uh, another four paintings that are on the show that is Four Horses of the Apocalypse. Well, one is coming from, from Venice, from the European Cultural Center where you exhibited. Um, but those paintings you were saying, you are talking that night, that they, they were done during the pandemic time. Yes. And um, how was that you lived the pandemic and, and why the Four Horses of Apocalypse uh, from the Genesis took place in those paintings? Could be another topic, another theme, another figure. But and then it, how did it occur that your expression would be the Four Horses of the Apocalypse? That, well, what's really interesting is that I conceived of them shortly before uh, the the pandemic came down before March. The the initial sketches were done in uh, like at the end of January, the beginning of February. Wow! And uh, and then you know this was announced when I had just started painting them. But uh, at at that time, I was living in Miami Beach, and we uh, had this little penthouse on top of a older building and. So I was kind of in my bubble up there. My husband, because my asthma didn't want me to leave the condo at all. So he, if anybody went out, it was him. And I just painted it at that time. The, uh, I, I felt that it was, you know, the four horses, uh, the conquest and then war and then famine and then death uh, are really um, a, a very good mythos for uh, what was happening at that time, the end of the world. And, and that's really what went down. The, uh, the first horse is conquest and plague, and, which was the beginning of the pandemic. And then the second horse, the red horse, is war uh, among men. And it, it really became very unsafe in Miami Beach during that time. People were very violent that were on the street. Not everybody, but there, it, it was not a safe place to be at that time. Uh, and then famine, um, you know, I could see from our condo uh, down at Collins Park where they were uh, giving out food to people that the um, the line, the people would come in their cars at, you know, four o'clock in the morning to line up for food. And the, it, the line went all the way down, way down Miami Beach of cars waiting all day. Um, so that was happening, and and then death was the last horse. The pale horse was really all our our fears of it was the end of the world. Everybody was really fearful at that time. So it looks then in the, these four paintings really first as the sketches kind of match to the critical moment that we were passing by in during the pandemic, and well, that extended so yes. long. It's interesting because uh, in in your work, I see that you are very aware or very connected, better, to to the deepest uh, reflections of life, to the deepest part of what could be our condition of human beings, or even in other ones, you as a as a autobiographical process through your dreams in in these women sinking but in another one I saw that also which is the hangman that you work uh, based on the tarot uh, illustration and then you change them and then and I see that very particularly that you had you represented the hangman uh, as a pregnant woman and so now how how do you connect with with womanhood, where the women's condition, not saying that you're a feminist in the activist way, but saying that you have a very deep sensibility to what is the meaning of us women in our society in different stages. Yes. Um, I, well, womanhood, <laughs> I, I think, you know, I always sort of... Uh, as a child and when I was younger, I resented, I, I grew up in a conservative family and uh, the role of womanhood to me uh, seemed subservient in a lot of ways. Uh, so I, I did, I always kind of resented that. Uh, and, and that's 
been my observation. I, I don't think that's so much true now in, in our culture, but uh, in, in a lot of the world, women are still property, and, uh, you know, there's human trafficking of women, and um, so I, in that particular painting, it was meant to represent uh, women being tied to their biological roles, uh, whether whether you want that or not. Uh, women are you know, we, we make babies, and that's that's who we are. And you can identify as something else, um, and that's totally fine. But uh, that's and you and you can choose different gender roles. But 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 women are are who are going to make the babies, and and that's the way things are. Yeah, but you said something very in interesting in here: subservient. Yes. What, what about that? Explain me. Explain me more. What is your vision about that? Uh, well, you know, when I was a child at, uh, say, holiday gatherings of family, uh, you know, I, the women had to do all the cooking and everything while the men sat there. And then, uh, you and know, afterward, there. then we would eat. And then afterwards, the women were expected to clean everything up while the men watched TV or something. Uh, and, and I just always, I felt like that was kind of unfair. Um, uh, my, my mother, uh, she had a nursing degree. Um, but shortly after she had me and she had my older brother and my younger brother, and she chose to be a stay-at-home mom, and she was wonderful. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, what do you, what do you choose? You, do you choose to stay home with your children? Not everybody can choose that, of course. Uh, or do you, you know, do you pursue a, a career? So that's, um, those were, those were kind of my observations it's one thing to say you can be whatever you want but if you are you know a star surgeon you and you have children you're, you're probably not going to spend a lot of time with your children during the day so. it's a kind of conflict in the, yes in yes. The, it's being resolved some way but it's always poses a conflict with women yes. you know by the way also that that called my attention to to how do you do because I know I know that you um, had uh, got a degree in architecture and did your profession for about 20 years. And how do you manage with that and with your kids and how many kids you have? So share with the listeners. Uh, well, I have four amazing kids, <laughs> and uh, they, they are incredible. I uh, When I uh, was first in architecture, I, I worked for a healthcare architecture firm and we did really great hospitals. And then I, I went to a firm that did commercial and residential and uh, we did city planning and um, a lot of uh, social sort of architecture as well. And uh, when I had my first child, I, there was a, a, a place right next to my office where I could have, um, you know, had them care for him during the day and I could have gone and nursed him. And, uh, and when it came time to do it, I just, I, I just couldn't do it. And, uh, my main client was Whole Foods grocery stores, which started in Austin where we were. That was when they were first really starting to expand. And they said, you know what, work at home and be with your child at home. And so I, I said, great. And, and I did that. And after a, about a year of that, I thought, you know, I, I could do this for myself. I, <laughs> I, I don't need to be working for, you know, through this firm, I was, which I love them. But I thought, you know, I can do my own thing. And, and so I started my own firm. And, and that, that was really a blessing, even though um, I, I was very good at architecture and I enjoyed it somewhat. Um, I, I would rather have been a, a painter at that time. Uh, it, it and enabled architecture really enabled me to um, to work and take my kids to school and uh, and be be at things for them and, and make my own schedule really. So it's it interesting because it wow you you got like a, a possibility to coordinate your professional life with your um, with your part of the uh, being a mother in there. I was very lucky in that I think. Yes. Wow. In in the, how let's just say you said the transition be, between how was it the transition between your architectural um, um, working to just be full time painter? How 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 talk to us about that? 
Well, um, I, I always uh, did something creative. I, I was a costumer uh, for a long time. I, uh, I cosplayed Wonder Woman for Heroes of Texas in Central Texas, and I, I was in parades and movie openings, and I did a lot of children's events and Make-A-Wish and things like that and, uh, and other cosplay things and, um, and costuming for shows and, and different stuff. So, uh, but at the end of my architecture career, I, it coincided with uh, my divorce and uh, things, just a lot of things really went south during that time, uh, not because of me, but <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that um, I, I, that's when I really started painting again. And, and it, was, it was really kind of a wonderful thing because, you know, before I could really paint any kind of way I wanted or do any kind of printmaking, but it always just felt like I was using my talent to create these images. And while I liked the images and I thought they were good, it, it wasn't... Um, I feel like now I really have something to say. Like it's all come together, and um, and so that during my divorce, that was a really intensive time of of really painting again. Um, so that's and then I met you. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do with all these paintings? <laughs> that's interesting yeah. <laughs> because uh, it's just like uh, when you started uh, started focusing more in your paintings it's just like uh, your life your life took sense yes. after your process of divorcing and how you put the architectural part in another place and you really gave sense to your life through your creation in there yes it, it was it was the rebirthing of myself honestly um and really um uh regenesis of my creative self to um, I, the freedom to be able to uh, just paint and not worry about somebody thinking I was wasting time or doing something frivolous and uh, or what is somebody going to think about this painting uh, that I could just do it and, and be me and uh, so that, that was a and that to was yourself. an amazing thing yes, yes that's interesting because I so also uh, meaning into the painting crossroads where you represent yourself in in that kind of transition, and then also another painting um, that you put into the uh, that is in the exhibition that is uh, nobody. Also, yes. also women representation autobiographical and putting also your process uh, into the painting. In, in, in a very pictorial way, in a very um, a stylistic way of um, finish your figures. That's another thing I just wanted to point out in here that I love the way. The first time I say, well, is this your intention? Is this because you don't finish <laughs> the paintings? And later on, I saw the, uh, the, the way that when I see all the paintings, I saw that was really your intention to create that kind of unfinishedness into yes. your pictorial approach to the fi- figures. And that's what I like right now. I say I, I realize that that's your language in there. It's, uh, I, I think it's a, a feeling of an everyman feeling for my figures that it's, it, it is me, but it's a representation. It's also a symbol of that person. Well, I, I, I'm very happy that you open up yourself so deeply and shared with us all this process of creation that you got. And I hope everybody will have the opportunity to, to know your work and to visit uh, the exhibition uh, that is going to be closing down on the 26th. And uh, it is also, you can visit in Little Haiti in 395 Northwest uh, 59th Street. And we will be having a big event on the 23rd, 7 to 10 p.m., that you really are going to enjoy. It's a surprise of the artist uh-huh. and another performance of another artist. And on the 26th, it's a brunch, um, 12 to 4, you also are invited. So, Makeover, thank you very much. I'm Milagros Bello, curator in Miami, and it's wonderful this encounter that you had. Thank you very much, Meg. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, bueno, muy, 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 muy interesante. 
uno aprende de, de cada persona. Entonces, casi que llegamos a, al final. Eh, tenemos dos minutos. ¿Cómo crees tú que podemos llegar a ser como Van Gogh? Van Gogh, de, de su mensaje era que, que crezca el arte y aparte de nuestro ego. ¿Cómo? ¿Qué? Van Gogh es el, el perfecto ejemplo de un artista que solamente se preocupó de crear. Eh, o sea, que se metió dentro de sí mismo, bueno, de una manera muy pasional y muy dramática, que dio con el suicidio de él mismo. Pero, pero sí, es, es el ejemplo, Van Gogh es un ejemplo como, como muchos otros, donde cuando el artista se, se mete dentro de sí mismo, sale una obra profundamente singular que no se parece a la de nadie, profundamente eh, eh, conectada con ellos mismos y que de alguna manera va a dejar historia. Así so, se hace la historia del arte. Sí, yo veo que, que logró ser, ser prof, muy prof, profundo. Y yo creo que su, se suicidó por tantos cosas, patrones y cosas de dañar un poco la mente, pero él logró dejar algo para las futuras generaciones. Pues yo pienso que con esto me despido, que todos nos buscamos cuál es nuestra misión. Y todos en general tenemos una misión, es mejorar el mundo para las futuras generaciones. Sin ego esperar de nada. Hacer para otro, servir. Entonces, muchas gracias. Nos volveremos a conectar el próximo jueves a las 4 de la tarde. Los esperamos. Gracias, Rafael, por tu invitación y por tu mensaje también, que es un mensaje a la humanidad. Sí. Y muchas gracias por venir y hablar de, de tu arte. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Bye. Bye.